to see you, and we're going to go to the Lord in prayer here in just a moment. And uh, as we go to God in prayer, let's remember we have uh, the surgery taking place this Tuesday for Maddie. And so let's pray for Maddie and her Aunt Julie and just all the things that go into that kidney transplant and all that. So let's pray for, for her and the whole situation there. And also, let's also pray for the White family. The White family's coming from Missouri. They'll be here on Wednesday. And so let's pray for them for safety as they travel in and get here on Wednesday, just like uh, we did this morning. Let's pray for them. One thing we'd like to do for them is uh, to uh, have some food for them next Sunday. If you came and decided to go to the grocery store, you could pick up some items to have. We'll have a tote back there, or a tub, big tub, or something like that for them. But I do know some of them have some kind of specific diets that they have to get. So I don't know. I don't think it's gluten. I'm not sure if it's gluten. I don't know. Does anybody remember when they were here what their diet was like? I was with them probably the most, and I can't remember because it was very unique. So with that being said, I'd probably stick to some things that are, you know, that uh, some canned goods that wouldn't uh, be anything that would mess up anybody's diet. Uh, I don't think it's, it has anything to do with seeds, you know, or I, I don't even think it's gluten. I'm not sure exactly what it was. I forget. But they do have some certain things like that. So, um, you know, canned goods, some Cheerios. I think Cheerios is gluten-free. You'd always be safe with that with kids. And they've got several kids. Amen. And so that's a safe thing. And you can think of some other stuff that you might be able to bring in for them be a blessing. Uh, as we try to get them here. When they came before, <clears throat> I think we had heard about some of their diet, and so we just got them a gift card uh, to Food Line and let them go buy their own food. That might be a great idea. Amen? Just get them a gift card and buy their own stuff. But that would be a blessing as well as they're getting acclimated in, getting settled in, all those things. Well, it is good to see you tonight, so let's pray together. Ask the Lord to bless the service tonight. Also be with each couple with prayer requests here tonight. And so let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, thank you so much for a great day this morning. And Lord, we do pray for <clears throat> several of our families that are out on the road traveling uh, for vacations. And God, you be with them, watch over them. And uh, Lord, we think of Maddie, and we're so thankful for her. And God, we do give her to you right now. And we pray that you'd be with her, help her to stay healthy these next few days before surgery. And God, we just uh, pray for Julie and and uh, end the whole situation there. God, give the doctors wisdom and help. And Lord, I pray for strength and recovery for Maddie and that she'd recover quickly and that her body would accept the kidney and that, God, you just would get the glory through it all. So, Lord, we pray for her and the whole situation there. <clears throat> God, we also pray for the whites. Thank you for leading them here to our church and to our school, and we pray you bless them. And, that, and God, I pray as they get adjusted here that, uh, that it would just be a good adjustment for them and that they get fit in and get busy just serving you here and I pray you'd use them and uh, Lord we pray for the service tonight that God you just would be glorified through every everything takes place here tonight God we pray for brother Kenny just uh, that you touch him help him with the pain that he's going through and uh, God we give him to you as well bless them our time together in Jesus name amen <laughs>
put up those hymnals. So page 58, Isn't the Love of Jesus Something Wonderful? Page number 58, let's stand and sing, Isn't the Love of Jesus Something Wonderful? Those hymnals, page 273, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Page 273, let's sing all three verses of Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Oh, 
Christians, whatever others do, I choose to be a Christian. As this world grows darker, my lamp will be burning, kindled with love for the one who is worthy. He gave his all, so I I will follow Christ, carry the cross that leads to light. I will be true, stand for my convictions, whatever others do. I choose to be a Christian. I will be bold, unashamed of the gospel of Whatever others do, I choose to be a Christian. I choose to be a Christian. I choose to be a Christian. Let's open up those hymnals to page 340. My faith has found a resting place page 340 and let's sing as you may remain seated. My faith has found a resting place not in device nor creed I trust the ever living one his wounds for me shall plead I need no other I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him. He'll never cast me out. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My heart is leading on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. All right, let's get our Bibles open to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> While you're turning there, let me just remind you about the Friday night. We have our leadership conference going on Friday night. I hope to see you here. Saturday morning, we have our teacher training. If you're interested in being a teacher in our church, 
Uh, I hope that you'll plan on being there or just getting some good teaching uh, principles that'll help you to be a better teacher. <clears throat> that'll be on Saturday. And if you're planning on coming to them, if to help us prepare uh, for who will be here, if you'd sign up, we'd appreciate that. <clears throat> then also we have our normal first of the month activities taking place, senior activity. I think on the same day as the senior activity, there's a game night with the ladies. And then we have our men's prayer breakfast that's coming up that second Saturday of the, of the month. And so we're going back into that, the first of the month activities that we normally have. <clears throat> I'd like you to look at Matthew chapter 5 and uh, call your attention to verse 10. One of the nice things about technology is my sister-in-law wrote me and said that Cheerios is not gluten-free. Is that right, Miss Linda? It's not gluten-free. And so I was wrong on that, huh? Huh? Is that right? Okay, all right. Well, thank you for that clarification. So, Aubrey, is that right? They are gluten-free? They are not gluten-free. Okay. Is that right? Okay. So, um, cross off the, the Cheerios, okay? Cross that off. Somebody told me that in Salisbury um, about the, that, and so I just ran with it because I'm not up to date on all those things uh, that are gluten-free and, and aren't. So, uh, but thank you, Annie, for that, and we can clarify. Probably best just to get them gift cards. That might be the best thing to do. Let them buy their own food, and that would be a blessing. Annie was interested in making a meal. If you'd be interested in making a meal for them when they get in, that'd be a blessing as well. But we'd have to try to find out what those restrictions are in order to do that. So I'll try to work on that this week. Now that I'm back, <clears throat> one, of the, um, one of the things that happened with us on vacation that was kind of interesting, well, I'll tell you the story because Kevin kind of got me after church and, and uh, told me I laid out a thing and then left a cliffhanger, you know, how Kevin expresses himself about our vacation, being able to go on vacation, I, and I left you on a cliffhanger and hoped you'd come back tonight, and I'm glad you're back here tonight. I didn't say I was going to tell you, but anyway, the way we were, how God provides for us is just an amazing thing, and um, we have, there is, um, since 2013, we were made aware, uh, Brother Patrick, some of you remember Dave Patrick, <clears throat> he told us about a place down in Tennessee, and uh, right outside of Pigeon Forge, that was for independent Baptist preachers, it's called... Um, Haven of Rest, Desert Place, Desert Place, Haven of Rest, something like that. They, it, they've got a couple different things like that. And it's three cabins up on the mountains, in the mountains, and uh, the Smoky Mountains. And independent Baptist preachers can stay there for free. So I thought, that sounds too good to be true. So I called uh, back in 2013, and he, the missionary that has it, the evangelist, whatever he is, that uh, has the place, he put me through the quiz. And uh, if you're... Independent Baptist, I checked that one off. Uh, do I use the King James Version of the Bible only? Is that the only Bible version I believe in? I said, yes, sir. I passed that test. And uh, then contemporary music. Do you allow contemporary music in your services? And I said, no, sir. Passed that test. They were basically, I felt like I was in an ordination thing, Brother Hatfield, is what I thought. And, uh, but I passed the ordination back years ago and passed that test. And so he allowed us to come stay there in his place, in his cabin for free. At that time, it's just a one-bedroom cabin, has living room and uh, kitchen all built into one, one bedroom off to the side, one bathroom. Living room had a two bunk beds on it, a queen-size pull-out sofa bed. So when the children were younger, um, the, uh, you know, it was fine for us. And so for 2013, we went there. 2015, we went there. 2018, we went there. And when we were there in 2018, we just decided as the kids got bigger, had Noli at that time as well, that we probably had outgrown the cabin. And so we were kind of disappointed in that because we made, had a lot of good memories. So we, uh, in February, March, March, we uh, used some of our um, income tax money to buy a, we rented a condo through Airbnb. And we paid the payment for the condo uh, at Airbnb, with Airbnb. And um, not, the past, not the Tuesday right before we left, but the Tuesday before that. We were less than two weeks uh, I got a call from the owner of the condo, and, um, and this was in Pigeon Forge, and he said that, um, or the owner said that it's not available for you anymore. We'll refund your money. Actually, they get, did give me an alternative. They said, you can stay in a little one-bedroom place. I said, how many does it sleep? They said, four. I said, how's, how's that even, you know, we told you how many we had coming. We need a bigger place than four. 
well, then we can just refund your money. I said, are you allowed to do... Actually, the first thing I asked them if it was a scam. I thought it was a joke is what I thought it was, a scam or something like that. But they said no, and they refunded our money. I, I told Tammy, I got a phone, told Tammy, I said, well, I guess we're not going on a vacation because when I went back on Airbnb, the same places that were $100 were now $800, uh, and there was no way we could do that, $800 a night, $800 a night for the places. <clears throat> uh, so uh, I said, we're just going to have to have a staycation, and our Tennessee trip was canceled. And, and thank God for a good wife. She said, why don't you have faith in God? And I said, that's good to say, but this is like unrealistic, less than two weeks of vacation. How are we going to get a vacation in Tennessee? How are we going to be able to do that? And she said, well, why don't you just pray and have faith in God? So I said, good advice, Tammy, but it's not going to happen. You know, it's just not, not going to take place. And so uh, I was coming up on Tuesday to uh, have some counseling with somebody uh, here back here to the church on that Tuesday night. We found out that Tuesday and was coming back here to the church. And I just so I thought, I'm going to call that preacher down in Tennessee, not that we could stay in the cabin, because we have to book those cabins like six months to a year in advance, and not them because they just book up. You say free to a Baptist pastor, a free cabin to a Baptist preacher, and I mean, they're gone. You know, people all over the country take advantage of those things. Uh, Samuel Owens was just there. Um, I didn't even know he was in the States, but Samuel Owens was there, uh, just stayed in one of the cabins. And so... I called him, I, I called the, uh, the missionary evangelist, I said, you know, here's our situation, here's what happened, we just outgrew grew it, and um, we loved your place, but we just outgrew it, and uh, here's what happened, how we got canceled, do you know of anybody that might have a cabin, let preachers, you know, that we could rent it or give us a deal or something like that? He goes, what weeks are you looking for? And I said, well, <laughs> I laughed. I said, it's less than two weeks away, but here's the dates when we were going to have it. He goes, you wouldn't believe it but I have the cabin you usually stay in, and then I have the other cabin that's right beside it, and they're both available. He says, it's hard to believe that they would both be available that week, but if you want two cabins, they're yours. I said, what are you talking about? He said, are you serious? He said, yeah. I said, now you're talking about two, less than two weeks from now, 2021. He said, yes. He said, if you want them, they're yours. I said, we'll take them. Write us down. So that was just amazing how God provided. I called Tammy, and I just laughed. I said, you were right. She goes, well, about what this time? <laughs> and I said, God did provide. She goes, I told you so. And, uh, and I, you know, us men, we don't like it when our wives tell us so, right? But she was right. She was right. So we, uh, we got to stay in the cabins. We had uh, two cabins down there in Tennessee. We're very thankful for that. Um, one thing that we did was, was kind of neat is how many of you have ever seen the television show Bringing Up Bates? You ever see that show? And uh, uh, they have a family, they're an independent Baptist family. They have 19 children, and they're on the Up Channel. <laughs> and uh, we uh, went to their church on that Wednesday night, and Leah and, and Melanie have watched them for years. I've never really watched them. To me, a family with 19 kids, even though they're independent Baptists, didn't really like my, not my kind of entertainment. You, know, you follow what I'm saying? And so, um, but... I've watched the kids at times watch it. I've sat there from a distance and watched them watch it and things like that, and the girls and Tammy and all that. So we went, uh, I said, well, let's, Leah was asking, can we, go to, can we go to this church? And she said, that's really the only thing I'd want to do is just go to their church on Wednesday night. So I said, all right, Angel, we'll take you to the church. So we took her to the, went to the church there on Wednesday, and, um, and sure enough, we walked in, and there was Gil, and that was kind of neat to see him. So I've met somebody famous now, <laughs> and uh, they're uh, a good church, King James, Independent Baptist, um, in the mountains of East Tennessee, and um, he came up to us and wanted to know where we were from and get our names, and so I said, I'm CK. I didn't tell him I was a pastor or anything. I just tried to stay undercover when I'm away, and uh, he said, but it all came out. We found out later on, uh, but... Um, uh, I said, uh, he said, what's the CK stand for? <laughs> and you knew what I said, right? Uh, I said, it stands for Clark Kent. He goes, get out of here, you know. <laughs> and uh, he goes, Superman's in the service? I said, yeah, yeah, he's here. And he goes, that's great. I can't believe it, Superman. And, uh, and he knew right away. He wasn't one of those ones that didn't know who Clark Kent was. He knew who he was. 
And he said, uh, he said he'll always remember us as Superman. And so anyway, uh, afterwards, we got to talk to him more, and we got to meet Mrs. Bates and some of the, the girls and things like that, so that was kind of neat. One of the girls who's married, uh, she said to Tammy, she said, I've got three kids, they're four and under. And I think it's Tori. Was it Tori that we got to meet? And so Tori said, I've got three kids, they're four and under. And she goes, I don't get a lot of adult communication. Can we go out to McDonald's? And would you like to get some ice cream? Because that was the only place that would be open after church. So we said, yeah, we'd go out to ice cream. So we went with her and her husband, got to eat ice cream. Very nice, down-to-earth people. Um, so then we, uh, I was talking to Gil in church, and I told him, I said, we came here uh, back last time we were here in 2018. We stopped by the church, but it was like Father's Day or something like that. And uh, you didn't have church that night. He goes, ah. Oh. I know it. He goes, I had some folks talk me into not having church on Sunday night, a Father's Day, because it was Father's Day. And he goes, I'll never do that again. You know, he goes, but that year I did. And he goes, we didn't have church that year, did we? And I, I said, no. I said, he said, you should have come by the house. I said, well, we did go by the house. He goes, what? He goes, yeah, we went and found your house. And we started stalking you at that point. And uh, he goes, well, why didn't you come up? And I said, well, I told the girls that we were going to come up, but when we sat out there in front of your driveway, we saw the red roof of the house and everything from the front. Uh, I said, Melanie and Leah were telling me I was stalking you by going up there and that there was no way we could go up there and stalk and be there and, and you know, and pull up there. They had been too embarrassed and all that. So we just left. I said, I did get your phone number from, uh, from one of the fellows at the building because they were in a funeral home at that time. And I said, I got your phone number. Is that it? And I showed it to him. And he said, yeah, I still have it in my phone. And um, he goes, yeah, that's it. He said, you should have just called and came on up, and we would have had you there in the house and all that kind of stuff on that night. Just down-to-earth people. He told me, he said, if the car ever breaks down and you're out this way again and it ever breaks down, I keep the keys to the car right in the vehicle. So just come on up, grab one, take a vehicle, go get your thing fixed, and then come back, bring it back to us. That's all we ask you to do. Just down-to-earth people, something you wouldn't do in Delaware, but I guess you can do it in the mountains of Tennessee. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that online. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Gil. <laughs> He'll have a vehicle missing now. Uh, but anyway, after when we went to McDonald's, we were with the one the daughter, and we didn't expect it. But all of a sudden, Gil comes up with his two other children with him, and uh, we stayed there for McDonald's, at McDonald's for about an hour, just talk with him. And he told me, I asked him, because we told him about the church and how we have one church, two locations, and he was talking about how busy that is, and he couldn't believe I do that. And... Uh, <clears throat> um, I said, well, how do you handle a tree business? Because he removes trees. And I said, pastoring a church and then also doing your, having time for your, your television program. And he told us how he did that a little bit. And, uh, and something that neat that he said is he said, you know, one of the things we decided when we prayed about doing this was we wanted the world to know, we wanted people to know that you can have a godly family, you can have a Christian family that loves each other, that loves God, and it has a desire to serve God. And he goes, that's the purpose of our show. He said, I told him right in the beginning that if they would not allow us to mention God to pray and have prayer and have the Bible in the shows, we wouldn't do the shows anymore. And he said, the first episode when we did the recording, he said, I don't even know what they put out there because we don't have a TV in our home. We don't watch, don't watch the episodes. Um, he said, uh, but the first one we did, and he said they didn't have, they cut out things about God, the Bible, and prayer. So he called the producer of the company and said, you cut these things out, you added those out, remember our situation. He goes, did it in a nice way, uh, not an ugly way. And, um, and, and the producer of the show said yes. Um, and so they re-edited the, the first episode with God, prayer, and the Bible and those things in that first episode. So they've been doing it ever since. But, but Gil told me something. He said, you know, I don't know how long the show can go on. He said, they could watch, somebody could watch me on YouTube. And he goes, I preach the Bible. And you know, with our culture today, how things are in our country. All it would take is for somebody to sue the network, and they don't have the money or the big-name lawyers to fight this thing, and, and then our show would be done. And um, with that, it reminded me of, you know, just the society in which we live and the persecution that we face as Christians. You know, we do face persecution as Christians, and I believe it's only going to get worse in our country. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, notice that expression. We're persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. Notice this. You basically say it would be for righteousness' sake again, wouldn't it? But he changes it a little bit. Jesus changed it a little bit, and he said, for my sake. That is righteousness' sake, by the way. Amen? Jesus' sake, his sake, his righteousness' sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Let's bow for prayer. God, please help me tonight. As we think about persecution in our country, help us to be, as Christians, to have a backbone, to stand. And God, I pray that you'd use us to make a difference in this world in which we live. Lord, help us to live a life that would be pleasing to you. Lord, help me to be a help tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Yusef Gujar was the man of, uh, name of a man and, uh, that was set free by the Pakistani court. Uh, he was, it was proven that he had murdered a man, his wife, their four children, and the wife, she was pregnant uh, with child. So really five children is who he murdered. Um, he was, he, he, what he did is he burned them alive um, where they would bake bricks in a brick kiln is where he, he, he burned them. He went to court and was set free by that Pakistani court because he was able to prove that he murdered them because they had converted from Islam to Christianity and had burned several pages of the Quran. His act was deemed to be a justifiable homicide. Now, that we have to understand there's persecution going on all around the world all the time. Christians are being per persecuted. It was on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, 2016, <clears throat> Many of us were gathered here, or you were gathered someplace in a church, um, worshiping and, and uh, the resurrected Savior, the risen Christ. And on that day in 2016, 74 of our Pakistani brothers and sisters uh, were killed in a bomb, detonated at their worship service. 300 were injured in that. The Taliban in Pakistan immediately claimed the responsibility of the bombing. And they killed those Christians and were set free, no charges, because those Christians gathered together to worship on Resurrection Sunday and worship the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. There's persecution taking place all over the country, all over the world. Now, <clears throat> on a lower scale, a lot lower scale, the baseball player, I think his name's Kurt Schilling, is that right? Kurt Schilling, pitcher, okay? So you heard of him before. Probably one of the greatest pitchers to ever play the game of baseball, what I'm told. Uh, after he retired from baseball, he became a commentator on ESPN and uh, sat there and he was fired from his being a commentator. You know what he was fired for, don't you? Well, let me tell you what he wasn't fired for. He wasn't fired because he forgot, and you know, he may have forgotten, they may have, you may think he may have forgotten that three strikes meant you're out. He wasn't fired for that because he didn't forget that. He didn't forget that four bad throws, we'd call them balls, would enable the batter to move on to first base. He didn't forget that, the, the balls. He didn't forget that Major League Baseball, you have nine innings. Um, he didn't forget any of those. <clears throat> what he did to cause himself to get fired from ESPN was he made a post on Facebook. And the post that he made on Facebook, he made this statement. He believed that a man ought to go to the bathroom in a men's room and that ladies ought to go to the bathroom in ladies' rooms. That great pitcher, a great baseball player, was fired from ESPN all because of a Facebook post voicing his Christian beliefs. Now, I like to say this. You know, when we think about persecution, it is a blessing. It is a blessing to be persecuted. You say, ha, ha, ha. Uh, I don't know if I agree with that one, Pastor. How is it a blessing when we go through persecution? Well, I'll give you the biblical definition of what persecution means in a moment. But <clears throat> if we didn't have our Bible, the next best place to look would be to get our 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Amen? Not a modern-day one, but an old one. That 1828 Webster's Dictionary. You can find it on your phone. In fact, you can look it up, 1828 Webster's Dictionary, and you can find that, that uh, edition of the dictionary. And the Webster's Dictionary says this, that persecution is hostility and ill treatment, especially because of race, 
or political or religious beliefs. So it's persecution, it's hostility or ill treatment, especially because of race, political, or religious beliefs. And so <clears throat> we could say, Webster would say, you could be persecuted for your religious beliefs, and you'll suffer hostility, you'll receive Ill, Ill treatment. That would be persecution according to Webster's Dictionary. And I'd still like to pose the question to you and ask you the question still, thinking about that, how is that a blessing? A persecuted Christian brother from the Af an African nation published an article on an Internet news uh, site. Um, the article was entitled, Trusting God Amid Suffering and Persecution. And he wrote these words. I'd like you to read these words to you that he wrote. He said, it is indeed difficult to trust and believe God in times of persecution. Many whose hearts are not strongly rooted in Christ fall away when they cannot see the saving hands of God. How do you, he went on to say, how do you persuade a woman whose husband and only son were brutally murdered to continue to trust God for deliverance when that happened to her, her family? How do you convince survivors of a Christian community whose inhabitants are attacked, killed, wounded, and displaced that all things work together for good to those who love God? How can you explain that? Those understanding God's Word will help us to stand firm and trust Him even in the most terrible situations in the church. Now, <clears throat> I, I read part of that article. I want to get to where he makes a statement, though, and I, think, I believe the statement is true. I agree with him on this statement here. He says, Christians' trust deficit, that is a lack of trust or a lack of confidence or a lack of hope or lack of faith, Christians' trust deficit can be attributed to a lack of knowledge of the ways of God. And what he means is this. He means that when you go through hardships or rebuke or persecution, he went on to say, when you do not trust God in that moment, it's because we really, we do not really know the Word of God, or more importantly, and more importantly, we do not rightly identify with the God of the Word. So basically saying that when we, you know, when we don't understand the persecution, when we don't handle that, uh, the, as we don't go through hardships and rebuke and persecutions properly, it's, it reflects the matter that we probably don't understand completely the Bible and the Word of God, or we don't know and fully understand properly the God of, this, of the Word. The question I've asked is, you know, how is persecution a blessing? How is persecution a blessing would be a good question. Tonight what I want to do is I want to show you the occasion of persecution. I want to look at that a little bit and what brings about persecution. In Matthew chapter 5, where we started, we saw in verse 10 and 11 some of the reasons, some of the things we see there. Blessed are, the, are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now, Jesus said it's a blessing. Jesus tells us it's a blessing. And, uh, and so it is a blessing when persecution occurs to you and I. Now, let me go on the record. Can I go on the record for a moment? I need to go on the record that every time that you face a hardship, every time you face hardship, it's not necessarily persecution. I hope you understand that. That every time you face a hardship, that's not necessarily persecution. It's my opinion, estimation, that most of what we experience as an American church is not persecution at all. It's more than likely it's inconvenience. Or maybe it's the consequences of our own sin. There are consequences that come because of our sin. For instance, sir, if your wife is upset with you, maybe there's trouble in your marriage. Maybe your marriage is suffering because of things. Uh, maybe you're, it's suffering because you're addicted to pornography and she's upset with you because of your addiction to pornography. That is not persecution. That's called being married to a godly wife. Amen? Amen? Hey, you young person that's here. Let's say you got in trouble because you've been disrespectful to your parents. That's not persecution for righteousness' sake. That's called good Christian parenting because as good parents, we should not, as Christian parents, we should not tolerate disrespect. Amen? And so there are some things that come because of our, the circumstances that we put ourselves in. 
So what brings about persecution? That's a good question to ask. Because if we're going to answer ultimately the question on how is it a blessing, the, what I need to know first is what brings about persecution. So I'm going to show you some things here, give you three simple things of, of what brings about persecution and will be done. Number one, persecution comes when we exhibit sanctification. When we exhibit sanctification. Persecution will come when you and I exhibit sanctification. Take a look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, Blessed are they which are persecuted, watch it now, for righteousness' sake. All right? For righteousness' sake. So as I live a righteous life, okay, as I live for God and I live a righteous life, the Bible says I will be persecuted. If you jump down to verse 11, he says, Blessed are they when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Do you see that? It's for Christ's sake. For my sake. So when you live a holy life and you live a righteous life, persecution is going to come. Now, I understand this. I'm personally convinced that persecution is on the rise in our country. Persecution is on the rise in the good old U.S. of A. But it's not because the church is getting more holy. That's not why persecution is happening in, in the United States. It's not because that the church is getting more holy. It's because the world is getting more hostile. That's why persecution is on the rise. And when you live for Christ, your very conduct will be the source of anger, the source of accusations from the world in which we live. Now, you know there is, a, there is an American religious system in which we live. There's an American religious system. And, and that American religious system does not mind religion. They don't really, they're not bothered if you talk of Christianity. As long as that Christianity is watered down. As long as it's a weak need version of Christianity, <clears throat> they won't say much about it. You can talk about it. Uh, but when you, you, know, you go outside of their boundaries or those boundaries, and, and you talk about Bible Christianity, when you start speaking about the authority of the Word of God, when you start saying things like, there's a way that seems right on the man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. When you start praising the name of Jesus Christ, when you start mentioning that there is a real place called heaven, but only to those that put their faith and trust in Christ, and those that don't trust Christ will spend eternity in hell. Amen? You know what? That's going to bring up some persecution. This world will turn on us, you know, because it steps outside of their boundaries of that American religious system. They'll turn on you like a dog with rabies. And so... Just because you get up and go to church doesn't necessarily bother your neighbor yet. It probably doesn't bother them yet. But when you start proclaiming that there's only one way that you can get to heaven, that's going to bring on persecution. Now, listen to what Paul said. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You live godly in Christ Jesus, you will go through persecution, all right? So if we live godly, it doesn't say that we might suffer persecution. It doesn't say that we can suffer persecution. It says you will suffer that persecution when you live godly in Christ Jesus. Now, here's a question you have to ask yourself. Here's a question I have to ask myself. What does that say about my walk with Jesus Christ if I'm not suffering some form of persecution. Did you hear me? What does it say about your walk with Jesus Christ if you're not suffering some form of persecution? According to the Bible, it tells us that, you know what, that if we live godly in Christ Jesus, we will suffer persecution. If we never experience ridicule, if we never experience criticism, if we never experience rejection because of our faith, we ought to really examine our faith. I mean, because the Bible says, if we are living for God, if we're living for Christ Jesus, we shall suffer 
persecution. Persecution is when you face difficulty for doing right. Did you hear me? Persecution is when you face difficulty for doing right. Punishment is when you face difficulty for doing wrong. There is a difference between the two. You do wrong, you suffer punishment. You do right and, and, and you face difficulty, you are being persecuted. And so every hardship in your life is not persecution. Sometimes it's the simple consequences of our sin. Now, in our text, let me give you the Bible definition of what persecution means. Because we've already seen Webster's Dictionary, what it means. Let me give you the Bible definition. In our text here, we see it twice. And, uh, and really, there's several words here. Persecuted, persecute, persecuted. Uh, you'll find that, that several times the, the word persecute or some form of it's mentioned here. And that word literally means to make, to run, to harass, to trouble, to pursue in a hostile manner. All right? We, we, it, it gives us a picture of that when we think of somebody who is hunting. All right, how many of you men in here hunt? Anybody in here hunt? When I asked that question in Salisbury, not one person hunts except for Kimberly. Kimberly was there. She raised her hand, Brother Harry. All right? I said, that, that really surprised me, Kimberly. <laughs> She's got a grin on her face. Thinking she probably hunted last time when she was 13 or something like that, right? Yeah, I got you. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, she thinks she hunts. She thinks she hunts, put it that way. And, uh, and so you think about it. Now, my dad, he was in Vietnam, and he never, after Vietnam, he never really wanted to handle a gun. So I didn't grow up in a home where we had guns. I didn't, he didn't have a problem with them. But we just never had a gun. We never went hunting. Now we fished, but he never went, went out hunting. And, uh, but I had family members that did. My uncle, he used to have rabbit dogs. Beagles, I think is what he had. Isn't that the rabbit dogs, the beagles? All right. And I remember just watching those beagles. He had them in an outside pen over there in Selbyville. And uh, I'm told, you know, as, as you think about it, I never, he never did take me hunting with his rabbit, rabbit dogs. But those rabbit dogs, they, they get out there in the woods and they start getting on the trail of that rabbit and they, they just start sounding the signal and they're smelling that thing out and they are hunting for that rabbit. Now, when that dog finds that rabbit, what do you think that dog's going to do? Like go up and shake paws with it? That dog wants to attack that rabbit, right? And in fact, the hunter knows, I guess what I've been told, is that that rabbit will run for a good distance, but then he will circle back around. And I don't know if that's true or not. Is that true? All right. He'll circle back around. Those dogs will chase him back around. He'll come right where that hunter is, and boom, the hunter takes the shot and gets the rabbit. But that dog wants that rabbit. That dog wants to eat that rabbit. He wants that rabbit. And so that's the idea here when we think of persecution. And so to be persecuted, all right, is like that dog or that animal going after that other animal to do it harm. So here's what it means. You know, what we have to understand is that the world is watching us. The world is watching us. They're stalking us. They're observing us. They're hunting us down. They're harassing us. They're trying to trouble us, pursue us in a hostile manner. And the same way, this is what Jesus tells us here, in the same way that a hunter has his eye on that wild game. All right? And so that means that the world is watching me. The world is watching you. Not watching to see if I will do right, but he hopes, the world hopes that I will do wrong. The world's watching me. The world's watching you in hopes, not that you'll do right, but that you'll do wrong. How many of you men have, and, and maybe ladies, have ever had a hammer in your hand and you've got that nail and you come down with that hammer and hit your thumb. Let's say that's at the job and you drop that hammer down on your thumb. And you know what you feel like doing? Letting out all kinds of words. It should not be mentioned here in church or ever. Amen? But all those words feel like coming out of your mouth. All because you hit that hammer on your thumb or maybe you slam a finger, a hand in, your, in the door or maybe you drop some heavy uh, object on your toe and you don't have your steel-toed shoes on, your boots on. And so the world is watching, hoping that you'll say something that you shouldn't say. And the reason do that 
The reason why is because they are trying to validate their own lifestyle and the way that they live. I mean, if you're a professing child of God, I mean, you're a church-going man, you're a God-claiming woman, and if you talk like a, a drunken sailor, that's what my sixth grade teacher here in Millsboro told me, by the way. Right? You know, my sixth grade public school teacher said to some kids in the class, says, you don't use words like that. They're the kind of words you hear at a bar. <laughs> We've come a long way because Christians are throwing them out of their mouths all the time now anyway. But my sixth grade teacher used to say that. What they're doing is they're trying to validate their own lifestyle. They want to see you use words like that to validate their lifestyle. And so what they will do is they'll validate their lifestyle when we say things like that because they're watching us, they're hunting, hunting us, they're trying to cause, you know, see us and cause us harm because what they're trying to do is trying to validate their sinful lifestyle and the, where they're living. And they might say, you have no business to talk to me about my immoral lifestyle when you have all these words coming out of your mouth. So the world is watching us, hoping that we do wrong, so that they can pounce on us. And when you stumble, the world gets glad. When the child of God stumbles, the world gets glad. But when you stand, the world gets mad. That's what happens. Why is the world angered by the righteous living of God's people? I can tell you why. It is a source of conviction. Us living for God, when we live for righteousness' sake, when we live for Jesus' sake, it is a source of conviction. And so you and I are told in our Bible that we should be different. We need to live a different type of life. That different life distinguishes us from the lost world in which we live. Hebrews 11 verse 13 tells us that we're strangers and pilgrims on this earth. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 tells me that I am to be a peculiar people. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 says that I am to come out from among them, that's the world, and be ye separate. We're to be separate. Now, the, if we're honest, the reality of this thing is the last thing we really want to do is to stand out from the world. Right? If we're honest. We don't like doing that. We do it for righteousness' sake. We do it for Jesus' sake. We do it because we know we should do it. But if we're all honest, we have to think about it. We don't. The last thing we'd want to do is stand out from everybody else. I mean, I remember back... Uh, when we had teenagers sometimes, I hear teenagers sometimes, they say things like this. You know, when I graduate high school, I won't have to deal with any of that peer pressure anymore. Now listen to me. If you think that when you get out of high school, you won't have to deal with peer pressure anymore, that's just baloney. Right? Because there's pressure on us all the time as adults to conform to this world. Well, you know, I get out of high school, I'm not really going to care what other people think. Oh, Really? You're really not going to care what other people think when you get out of high school. You're going to care what other people think the rest of your life. All right? And the last thing, you know, the last thing we want to do as Christians sometimes, the last thing we want to do, you get around people that are lost, maybe at a family event or maybe some things like that. You get around lost people and, and they talk about a movie. And what, what movie? <laughs> That's the number one blockbuster hit out there and you've not seen it. Or they'll start talking about some rock and roll song or some modern song that's out there on the radio about how good it is. You don't know what it is. I've never heard of that before. Some of you never heard of bringing up debates. Shame on you. I can't believe it. <laughs> you know, and you think about it. Uh, we don't want to stand out from everybody else. Now, let's, let's just be honest a little bit. Let's be honest. I think, guess we ought to be honest. We're in church. I guess we ought to be honest with Christians. Amen? That'd even be better. Now let me ask you something, you ladies. Let's be honest about this thing. When was the last time you really suffered ridicule for dressing modestly? Oh, I don't know if I want to dress modest. I'll get made fun of. 
When's the last time you really suffered ridicule for doing that? And I mean, you look around at people, especially this time of the year, they're running around three-fourths of the way naked. Right? But when was the last time, really, you got ridiculed for your modest dress? You, th you just, maybe after church, you tell me. All right? I just was ridiculed just last week, and, and that may be the case. But you know, there's certain things that we get in our mind that, that we shouldn't do certain things because we're going to get ridiculed. I can tell you this, you know, we've been here 13 years. I have never got a call from the Little League Association over here. They say, why would they call you? I'm the pastor. I've never gotten a call from that Little League Association over there asking me when our spring revival meeting is because they're concerned that some of our kids wouldn't show up because they'd be in revival meeting. You know why? Because it seems like sometimes the little league field over there is more important than being in the house of God. Right? You see, we just, we, for the most part, we blend right in with the rest of the world in which we live. And, and the bottom line is, as God's people, we tend to act and live and respond just like the rest of the world. I'll say this, when you exhibit sanctification, you will face persecution. Back in the 1880s, I believe, is when this was first came up. Charles Penrose, he came up with, wrote an article right about after Civil War time, and he was warning about the danger of hyphenated Americans. Who in here knows what a hyphenated American is? Nobody in here knows what a hyphenated American is. You know what a hyphenated American is? You know what a hyphenated American is? All right, that's right. You were born back in 1850 or something like that. I, I got you. So you probably think. You're what? You are English American. All right. <laughs> so he's, he's on the right track. They warned about the danger, what they called hyphenated Americans. He warned, they said that it's the dangers of foreigners and immigrants who wanted to immigrate to America, but not assimilate into America. They wanted to come here, but they didn't want to be like us. They wanted to learn the language, and they warned about the dangers of that. Hyphenated Americans, all right? So it's people that wanted to come from other countries, and they're welcome to come. Thank God for the Statue of Liberty, amen? A symbol of that. And people have been coming to our country for years. You, know, you talk about now, that southern border, they're just coming <laughs> like crazy over the border, and it's a mess. That's all I'm told. But, you know, they want to come to America, but they don't really want to become Americans. And Penrose called their little hyphenated uh, groups hyphenated Americans. He would say he'd be like an Italian American, a German hyphen American, Asian hyphen American, African hyphen American. Penrose warned about the fact that when you come to this country, you're going to have dangers. And if you don't assimilate and express a willingness to become just like everyone else, you're going to have those dangers. During World War I, the problem was so prevalent that President Woodrow Wilson said that the American who carries around a hyphen carries is like carrying around a dagger that might be thrust into the internal organs of the republic at any moment. He warned about being a hyphenated American. Teddy Roosevelt would later say that there's no such thing as a hyphenated American who is a good American. If you're hyphenated, a hyphenated American, according to Teddy Roosevelt, you're not a good American. He wrote that the only man who is a good, is a good American is the man who is an American and nothing else. <laughs> I'm thankful I'm an American. Amen? Now, we're talking about public policy. We're talking about American citizenship, the ability to come and blend in and be a part of a larger culture. And I'll tell you what, that makes excellent civics, but I will say this, that is awful theology because it is unbiblical Christianity that thinks that we can live in this world and we should assimilate and be like everybody else. The Bible tells us that we're in the world, but we're not of this world. You and I as Christians ought to be different. And we will.
go through persecution when we exhibit sanctification. Let me give you the second one. Number two is when we explain the Scriptures. When we explain the Scriptures. You know, when the light of the world, you know who that was, Jesus Christ came and began to speak out the light of the Word, that's when persecution began to come to the Lord. And the reason is because men love darkness rather than light because they're what? Their deeds are evil. Most police officers, security experts will tell you that one of the greatest deterrents of crime is light. One of the greatest deterrents of crime is light. People take floodlights and put them around their house so that at night people won't hide in those dark places around their home. I can tell you the greatest way to get rid of crime was to, is to cause the sun to stop setting every night. If we could do that, then we'd probably be a lot better off. But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Now, <clears throat> when Jesus began to speak the truth of the Word of God, that's when persecution came against our Savior. Stop and think about it. The world loves the baby Jesus in the manger. The world will even celebrate the baby Jesus that's in the manger. The world will set, make its own holiday to honor the baby Jesus in the manger. Why does the world love baby Jesus in the manger? Well, the answer to that is, it's because that baby hadn't started talking yet. But when he began to talk, he began to speak the light because he is the light. And when that happened, persecution began. Persecution will come to you and I. And you remember in Acts chapter 4, verse 18, it describes some of the encounters of the early apostles. They were told by that religious council that they were commanded that they should not what anymore? You know what it was? Speak. They were not allowed to speak anymore. They were not allowed to teach in the name of Jesus. And so in other words, here's what they said. All right, it's okay for you to believe what you want to believe. And it's all right for you to think what you want to think. And it's all right for you to have those thoughts of those, those that you want to have. But you keep your opinion to yourself. Especially keep your words to yourself. And you know, the same thing's happening today. You look at what Facebook has done. You look at what Twitter has done. Censored the, the President of the United States of America. All these social media platforms have, have, have hindered the free speech. We say we're a free country. And we have freedom of speech. We don't have freedom of speech anymore. Do you know that the President of the United States, <laughs> our current one at least, if you want to call him that, he's come up with a list of the 12 most dangerous people in the country. The 12 most dangerous people in the country. You know who they are? They're medical experts and scientists who are speaking out against COVID-19. See, you can have your opinion, you can have your thoughts, but don't speak out. They're all deplatformed, by the way, on all the major social media sites because they don't want that getting out. All right? Keep your opinion to yourself, especially your words. Jim Baker, you've heard that name before, haven't you? Not the one you're thinking about, that televangelist. We're talking about Secretary of State. Jim Baker was the Secretary of State during the Reagan, Ronald Reagan administration. And it was said that he'd bring newly, amb newly appointed ambassadors into his office. And they had one, he had one of those large spinning globes, you know, like you see in the classroom. And the Secretary of State would spin the globe around. He'd ask that new ambassador if they could locate the country that they had just been appointed to represent. They began to look all over that globe and search all over the globe for some little way out of the, out of the way country most people never heard of. And Jim Baker would stop that globe and he'd take his finger and he'd plant it on the United States of America and he'd say this, this is the country you've been appointed to represent. And I'd like to say this tonight. I hope you understand that whether you're at the, if you're called to minister at the workplace or in the community or on the ball team or in the club, that this is the kingdom which you've been called to represent. You're called to represent God's kingdom. Amen? 
And as God's people, that's who we need to represent. <clears throat> so, you know what? You're going to face persecution when you begin to speak up. You say, what's that sound like? Let me tell you what it sounds like. It sounds like a student maybe graduating from high school, a Christian student, and they go off to one of these secular universities. They're sitting in a classroom, and the professor of that classroom gets up and starts talking about a woman's reproductive rights. And maybe they don't open up the Word of God because they've hidden God's Word in their heart. They've got it in their mind, the Word of God. But they begin to say, you know what, I'm a Christian. Maybe they stand up in that classroom and they say, I'm a Christian. And I believe that all life is created in the image of God. And I believe that we should praise God because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I believe that God is the creator of life and no person has the right to take un an unborn human life. Amen? I can promise you this. That Christian young person that does that at those universities, colleges and universities, they will suffer persecution. And I'd even go as far to say that even at some Christian colleges and universities, they'd suffer persecution today. When you began to say that God made male and female in the beginning, and He's still making them that way today. Can you believe that? That He's still making them that way today. And when you say that you don't get to decide, you don't get to change in this culture, you'll find yourself an object of persecution when we stand up and we speak. Keep your convictions to yourself. You know, that means what we basically have to do as Christians today is we have to shut our Bible, shut our lips, and if we do those things, we'll be okay. But if we open our Bible and we open our lips, you mark it down. We will suffer persecution. We'll suffer persecution when we, when we exhibit sanctification. Number two, when we explain the Scriptures. And number three, when we exalt the Savior. When we exalt the Savior. Go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. And verse 40. <clears throat> Acts chapter 5, verse 40. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and had beaten them. Now, when, they, when the Bible says they beat them, I hope you understand it's not like this. A slap on the back of the hand or on the wrist. It wasn't that kind of slap. This is beaten nearly to death. They commanded them that they should not... Oh, look at that next word. What's the word? Speak. You see it? They should not speak in the name of Jesus. Didn't we just talk about that? Speaking or explaining the Scriptures, our speech, they weren't allowed to speak anymore. And they let him go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Now look at verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Do you see that? What did they do? They were exalting the Savior. So the disciples, these early apostles, were being persecuted. They were told not to speak anymore. They went right back out, and they spoke about the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a, there's a little uh, logo, a little expression. We've seen it probably. I have a picture of it here on my phone. Let me get to my photos here. And I, I could have brought it up on the TV screen. Probably still could do that. But you ever see this, this picture? Coexist. Coexist. You look at that picture, and you know what they have on it is they have the first symbol. The C is, is actually an Islamic symbol. And then they have a peace symbol. And then they have a science symbol. 
And then they have a Jewish symbol, the Star of David. And then they have a pentagram, which would be a sign of the occult, symbol of the occult. Then we have the yin-yang, which is the Orient symbol. And then at the very end is a cross. Coexist. I guess the bottom line, what they're trying to do is they're trying to tell us that in order to coexist today, that we have to accept the Muslims and the scientists and the Jews. And notice at the very end is the cross. The cross. This small little cross there at the very end. Now, <clears throat> we hear that all the time. How many of us ever hear? I just, somebody just told me this in the last couple of weeks. I believe, this person said, not me. They said, I believe that all paths, we all have our own individual paths, and all paths lead to God. You ever hear that before? You can have your path. You can have your Muslim path. You can have your Jewish path. You can have your Christian path. You can have your other path, whatever. All paths are going to lead to God. And you know, we can coexist. We just believe that. Now, they've, that's what the coexist idea. They've taken that today, and they've overlaid it. I, know, I hope you understand what that means, to overlay it. That means, like, if on that, in that case, it has a black background, and the symbols were all in white. So to overlay that would mean that they, the symbols now not would be in white, but they would be overlaid with a rainbow. They've added something to the regular symbols, the Islamic symbols and the peace and the science and the Jews and atheists and the, or, the Eastern culture and the Christian culture, and they've overlaid it with the rainbow. And they've added gay, gay to it, homosexual to it. We can all coexist. We can all live together. We'll all be peaceful. We can all coexist <clears throat> with all that. It's interesting. This is a little side note. I found this out. The, you know, last month was gay pride. And so you saw the, the flags, the gay pride flags flying everywhere. If you count the number of stripes, the number of colors on the flag, the gay flag, there's only six. If you count the number of colors on the rainbow that God created, there's seven. Seven colors on the rainbow. They can't even get that right. They think they're imitating God and mocking God, but they can't even get that right. There's seven on God's rainbow, six on man's. Kind of makes sense, too, because the number of perfection or the number of God is what? Seven, and the number of man is what? Six, and so they did get that right. Maybe that's on purpose. Makes sense, doesn't it? But they try to tell us that we need to coexist. And so... As long as, you know, you coexist with everything and you don't bring up too much about Jesus, then we'll be okay. But our Bible says, you know what? You and I need to be, just like that early church, ceasing not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus is the only way that we can get to God. He's our only way that we can get to heaven. And by saying that, we will suffer persecution. So the bottom line is this. <clears throat> How's it a blessing? How's it a blessing, Pastor? I'm glad you asked it. I'll use a story to illustrate it, and then we'll be done. The story is told about a concert, the recital that was taking place of a solo violinist. He had a major recital that he was going to be playing. The concert hall that night was filled to capacity. On the final note of the final song, the violinist had done such an amazing job that the crowd leaped to their feet. They erupted with a thunderous applause. A standing ovation was made. Backstage, there was a stagehand that was standing there with the violinist. And the stagehand said, they're calling for an encore. Go back out. They're all standing. They want one more song. And the violinist said, I can't go back. I can't face that crowd. The stagehand said, why not? They're standing to their feet. The violinist said, they're not all standing. The man down in the middle of the front row, he's not standing. The stagehand said, that's just one old man out of thousands that are cheering you on. The violinist said, that man's my instructor. That's the man who knows more about what I should have done 
and could have done than the rest of the room combined. And you know, I think that violinist was on to something. You know, you think about it. The rest of the world may be standing and applauding, but if Jesus is not pleased, then what have we really done? You know, <clears throat> I want my Savior to be pleased with my life. Let me show you one last, pass, one last verse. And this last verse found in 1 Peter chapter 2. Turn with me there, please, and we'll be done right here. And after we read this verse, I'll share with you my prayer as your pastor and also a prayer as a fellow believer. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. Here's what I want more than anything. Look what the Bible says. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults... Ye shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. Now look at this last part. Boy, I'd underline it if I were you. This is acceptable with God. I want my life to be acceptable by God. I want my life to be pleasing to God. And my prayer for you as your pastor and also as a fellow believer, <clears throat> is that when we do right and we suffer patiently with endurance, that we also will experience blessings. And my friend, that's having God's favor upon our life. I want God's favor upon my life. I want God's favor upon your life. And that's one of the blessings of persecution. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, please help us. Tonight, to understand maybe a little bit better the persecution that we've been going through. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be different, that God, you'd help us to have a backbone, that you'd help us to stand, that God, you'd give us some Christians here that would not get caught up in this woke culture, this anti American culture, this really this anti-Bible and anti-Christian culture. God, give us some Christians with a backbone. Give us a Christian, some Christians that will live for righteousness sake, that will live for Jesus sake, and that will live a life that would be acceptable to you. God, I want my life to be pleasing to you. Lord, help all of us that want to have that kind of life and live that life. And when we suffer the persecution, that we would realize that we're living our life to be acceptable in your sight. And so, God, I pray that you bless the invitation now. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand with our head bowed and eyes are closed. The piano.